Hello and this welcome thing. to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 91, Tabletop Gaming Enhanced. Ways to enhance the mood and create immersion in your game night. From the Golden Horseshoe, I'm Sean, and live from the City of Roses, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. You can join us Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. Now, in addition to our main topic of game night enhancements, I'm going to have a review of King Me, a family game that's based on checkers. Uh, in addition, I've got a mix of games in our week in review, including Unlabeled, the blind beer testing game, and some new with some new house rules, as well as another play of Eminent Domain Exotica and a bit more about King Me. And I've got a couple of new-to-me digital board games that I gave a try last week. Sounds good. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interaction with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of in the last week. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We adore your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Up first, a comment on our Pathfinder Adventure card game unboxing. Chris Groff writes, I do think there is merit in using the core concept as the foundation for an RPG. I <laughs> like the way the characters worked with their deck, being their health, for example. I think there are some pseudo RPGs that have done this. Didn't Penny Arcade kickstart one that did this? And I thought there was a kids RPG that kind of did this as well. Oh, well, thanks for the comment, Chris. Uh, the only Penny Arcade games I played was uh, the Penny Arcade deck building game, which is, if I remember, uses the Cerebus engine, the same engine the DC deck building game uses, where you're fighting a main boss and trying to get up enough power to defeat that boss, then you get to put the card in your deck. Uh, and then a game, which I should have Googled the name of, it was a com two-player combat ping pong game. Uh, that was rather unique. It was an interesting game. It was Russia versus U.S. through the Cold War, playing ping pong. You used a D20 to see if your shot stuck. Uh, it was really unique, but it definitely didn't use your deck as health. So I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but as for Penny Arcade games, I know I don't know of any that did. Now, as for games trying to recreate the feel of a role-playing game, the one thing I've always ended up saying or always end up feeling is... Once you get to that point where your board game, your card game is so close to an RPG, I get that feeling, why, why don't you play an RPG? Like, why are you bothering to play a, a board game at this point? Now, sometimes I guess it makes sense, right? In this case, the Pathfinder game, I can kind of see it because you may not be able to find a DM because DMing Pathfinder is, is a lot of work. There are a lot of rules in Pathfinder. There's a reason it has the, uh, the moniker Mathfinder for many players. It's one of the crunchier games out there. And I can see how there might not, someone might not want to learn that thick, I don't even know, I, I have no idea how thick Pathfinder is. It's gotta be like 600 p. It's, it's a tome. Uh, I can see where I don't want to learn this tome. So instead we'll play this simple card game. So I get it there, but in general, most of these games, I'm like, if I sit down, and this is how our role-playing group started. I was like, if we can get four of us together to sit down and play this board game every week, why aren't we playing Warhammer? And that's actually how my three-year-long Warhammer campaign got started. Because I'm like, if you're going to get that close to be playing an RPG, why not play an RPG? Now, I haven't tried the Pathfinder Adventure Card game yet. It's it's on the list. Deanna and I, we haven't decided. We had, we had promised Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, to uh, play three players with him. And I'm trying to decide what to do about that because who knows how long it'll be before that can happen. And I do owe uh, Paizo a review of this product. So we're thinking about, I also own the first Adventure Path, is playing through the original box, just Deanna and I. And then when Sean and we're able to get together with Sean again, maybe then we'll play through the expansion. And by that time, Deanna and I should at least know how to play, which might be a smoother transition anyway. Because despite the fact it's way thinner than the full rules, this is not a light card game. 
All right. Well, Vincent Manning commented on our where to find out of print games article mm -hmm. to say, nice, I'm going to use this to check for hero quest. Mm -hmm. Hard to find it, com for, find it complete for less than $300 these days, but they're still out there. Well, thanks for the comment, Vincent, and good luck with that hunt. Uh, I got to say, it seems everyone is still on the hunt for a good copy of Hero Quest. It's one of those ones I thought that eventually people, like, I don't know, the, the group of gamers who grew up with it would have grown past it or have already shown it to their kids. But man, that still is, like you said, going for like 300 bucks for a complete copy. What I do recommend, though, at this point, is maybe check out the alternatives. If, if you really just want that feel of a role-playing board game, a simple role-playing board game, uh, there's Alter Quest, which was kickstarted, that looks fantastic. We saw that at Origins last year. It's got the plastic scenery and everything. That really felt like it. Or uh, Broadsword from fan of the show Teldurn, who sometimes stops in our chat room here. That is not as much a board game. Like, you're not going to go out and buy a board and have all the scenery. It's more of a system for creating your own dungeons that are very Hero quest focused hero quest style it's like an evolution of of hero quest kind of like what games workshop did with advanced hero quest though i get it like i understand people want the original hey, if you got that collector's urge you've got to own it but there are alternatives out there now all right well keith davies has a recommendation for us uh, based on our two-player cooperative game article i quite like fires of Ed edlion idlion 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 big Idolan, bad Big Bad was sealed away generations ago, and its prison is starting to break. A mm -hmm. band of doughty heroes, I haven't played it solo, have played with up to four, and it works at all counts, brave the prison to destroy the three MacGuffins the <laughs> Big Bad needs to unleash the Big MacGuffin, and steal that right. and get out of prison. As long as someone makes it out, the team wins, though some heroes may need to make the ultimate sacrifice. Interesting. Well, thanks, Keith. Uh... This isn't one I've heard of at all. Now, I did do a quick search for it earlier. It looks like it's Fire of Eidolon, not Fires. So Fire of Eidolon. I got to say, looking at it on Board Game Geek, this is something I wouldn't have given a second look. It's got that, the, the box looks like a Super Nintendo cartridge, and it's got 16-bit graphics. And I, to be honest, that does nothing for me. I, I think, like, yeah, I grew up on Nintendo, but I don't know. That that nostalgia, that that's not something that ever goes off on me. I'm like, oh, that looks neat. No. I don't know, though. Uh, Keith says it's a good game. I've seen the games Keith likes. We do have a lot in common as far as the type of games we look, so it does look like a decent game. What we'll do is, as usual, we'll throw a link to it in the show notes. That is uh, Fire of Eidolon. Well, next up, a comment about last week's topic of free D6 games. No bargain ba basement bathysphere, Brock Wagner asks, or Wigger asks. <laughs> Brock, uh, Brock got at me on, uh, on Twitter on this one. Uh, thanks for reaching out, Brock. Now, I have to admit, I totally forgot about this, which is ironic, because Brock had pointed it out to me when we were collecting games for that list of, uh, at the time, 100 free games to keep you busy while stuck at home, that list we've been sharing links to every week. It's now up to 250 games. But he reached out and was like, hey, you got to put this bargain basement bathysphere on the list, it's a fantastic game. And I completely forgot about it when we were talking about D6 games. So fair enough. Uh, what I did do is when I put out the article uh, on the blog from last week's topic, I did include it. So it's on there, Brock. We just missed it in the show. But now it's on this week's episode, so we got you covered. All right, we're going to finish off with a series of positive comments that free D6 games uh, gave us. So John James says, nice write-up, Mo." Blaine Mather, well done. I shared your article on my Facebook page as a possibly helpful resource for my friends and family. Awesome. Sen Fu Lin, Lim writes, good work, great work. David Johnson, great, thanks. Oh, thanks for the comments, everyone. I gotta say, this particular article has been doing rather well. So I do want to thank everyone who's been sharing it on their social media, specifically on Facebook. It seemed to, I wouldn't say went viral. It didn't get that big, but way more shares than our usual content gets. And I saw people I didn't even know talking about it and sharing it. So that's pretty awesome. It looks like we got a hit here. And uh, I'm glad because this is a, it's a great resource of uh, free-to-play stuff, which... Right now, with what's going on in the world, more and more people are looking for, and pretty much everyone's got D6s at home. So glad to see that one worked out. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares comments and interacts with our content. A few quick announcements before we continue. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so now it's time to make sure you've checked out all our formats. Board Game Geek, the podcast, the website, YouTube, MeWe, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, even Pinterest. And Tabletop Bellhop, pretty much everywhere. 
excuse me, sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, usually on Wednesdays, I send out an email that recaps all the content we released in the week previous. Uh, blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, unboxings, actual plays, anything we create would cost a link in there so you can keep track of everything that we put out. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. All right, one of the things Deanna has been working on this week that should go live by the end of the week, and I'm pretty sure it's not there yet, is to take our list of free gaming content provided by designers and publishers to keep us all busy while stuck at home into two lists. We want to split it out so there's one just for RPGs and one just for board games, because the list is getting huge. We're at over 250 items. It's just a bit much to scroll through, so we're going to try to split it up so that like the role-playing fans can go to the role-playing section, the board game fans can go to the board game section, and people like me will check out both. You can find if you haven't checked out that list lately. Deanna has been adding new games to it daily, including some yeah. great new stuff from Asmodee, including free copies of Ascension, Onitama, and Honorim in digital format, and a solo mode for Arcadia Quest from Simon Games. It's now Come On Games. Unfortunately, they decided they don't want to be called Simon anymore. They want to be called Come On. Okay, yeah. I'm not going to say that on the air, I don't yeah, think. Come but... on, games. I don't know. That, that's their choice, but just point that way. It used to be Simon. Everybody used to call them Simon. Now it's come on, games. Yeah, maybe I'll just go back to calling them Cool Mini or not. <laughs> yeah, you could do that. Cool Mini or not, games works as well. Uh, you can find the list over at tabletopbellhop.com. Uh, you'll see it. There's a link at the top of the page, and we'll be sure to drop a link in the chat room and our show notes. All right, for those of you here live in our chat room in the lobby, we got a special treat during the Penthouse Suite after show tonight. I invite you to join us for a two-player game of Lanterns as part of Renegade Game Studios Worldwide Play Day. Mo and Dee will be playing a game and trying to hit as many of Renegade's challenges as they can. Now, as part of this event, this is the important part. It's what you want to turn on your ears for. Everyone who joins in, everyone who's in the chat room, by simply saying something in the chat while we're playing the game, will be entered to win a Renegade Games prize pack. I personally think everyone should bet on who will win the game. I know where my money is. Yeah, I'm sure it's on me. Always, right? Now, this may just become a weekly thing. Uh, we did this last week. For anyone who was here last week, I played Fuse solo. Uh, if Renegade keeps up with these events and these challenges and we own the game, I don't see why not. We'll, we'll probably keep doing this in our after show. All right. The last Wednesday of every month, we host a live AMA. For anyone who's been around for a while, I'm sure you're used to hearing this. Uh, we do that here on Twitch, twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop, and we encourage everyone who can to join us, and we'll answer your gaming and game night questions live. Now, for those of you who can't make it to our live show, we get it. We record pretty late and into the middle of the week. This month, we're going to try something new. As of right now, we invite you to send in an audio clip to us through Skype. To do this, you just have to give a Skype call to Sean, that's S-E-A-N, at tabletopbellhop.com. All one word. And just leave a message in the voicemail when the, after the nice uh, British lady tells you to. Yes, the British robot we've trapped inside our Skype. Now, what we plan to do is play these clips on the show and then answer the questions live. Now, we're also really hoping to be able to accept live Skype calls during the AMA segment of the show with the aim of turning this into more of a live call-in show, right? Like, call in and we'll answer right now, as well as interacting with those of you in the chat room as usual. For the live call-in functionality, we do still need to do some testing because we don't want to risk the quality, the quality of our connection and therefore the show when there already are the occasional issues, but we are absolutely looking into it to make this as much of a live call-in show as we can. Yeah, I think it'd be a pretty cool thing for, like I said, once a month. This won't change our normal format. It'll just be something new we're offering during our AMAs. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the, double, the show after the double bell with more chat and some content that otherwise only our patrons will get. Yeah, and our patrons are going to get to listen to DNI play Lanterns, and that's just not going to be the same as being here to see it. So we're going to have to try to make sure we talk a lot while we are playing. Absolutely. So what do we got going on in the lobby? I did well, see, we had a little um, bit of uh, beer talk earlier on, yep. uh, and apparently Tech has gone like an entire week without winning anything from Renegade Games. No, I think so, it's like, an, it, has it been a week? Yeah, it's since last Wednesday, <laughs> so, right? So, 
we'll have to we'll have to see if that changes in the after show because well again, we won't we won't find out in the after show yeah. we won't find out till tomorrow who the winners are no one from our show won last week unfortunately but tech did win in the afternoon show of last week yes he won in the uh, afternoon show and he won during um our clank actual play when we did it so that's twice he's won from renegade which it's possible he hasn't won anything yet because, or received anything yet due to shipping issues. I am waiting on so much stuff. That's actually a thing that's going on right now. So this is a cool one. I got blind, uh, blind pitched. I, I, that's not the term I wanted to use, but whatever. Someone, someone blind contacted me, and it's a company in Canada that does a mail order escape room where they send you uh, some kind of escape room in a, I don't know if it's in a box in an envelope or whatever. And they're going to send me one of those to check out. So I'm looking forward to that because uh, Deanna and I have rather enjoyed the exit games we've tried, at least the, the in theory, uh, the last one was a little too easy, but like the whole concept of it is fun, the solving puzzles. So that'll be something cool to check out. Um, I've got something coming from Daily Magic Games, their latest Valeria game. So that's on its way in. Um, I did get the bicycle stuff. I, and then uh, CGE, Check Games Edition, is sending me a couple things too. So I'm just, I'm waiting for the mail. Like they've all been shipped. They all should be here, to be honest. Well, except for the, sorry, the, the escape room thing shouldn't be because I just found out about it today. But um, everything else should be here. So I don't know what the holdup is. Hopefully it's stuck at the border. I'm not going to get hit with a ton of uh, customs fees or something here. Well, who knows right now? I mean, the mail carriers are overwhelmed. And in the States, we've seen, you know, concerns about the whole process going bankrupt. So yeah, um, we'll see what we'll see what's we'll see. happening. And, and bless those carriers for doing work, well, the work they're doing right this. now. God, yes. I can't, uh, can't even imagine. Um, yeah. They're, they're putting their lives more at risk than my wife, the nurse is. Yeah. Um, but uh but yeah, so we get we got some stuff coming. I, I'm happy about this. this. This makes me happy because I was concerned with no cons, not like running out of work in a way, right? Like yeah. literally running out of work. Not that I don't have enough of my own games we can talk about and I can unbox or whatever, but I definitely prefer to, to work with people promoting their stuff as well. So that's been pretty cool. So that is some stuff to look forward to in the, in the coming weeks. Uh, it's inter- I'll be interested to see that uh, escape room because the, the quick read I did of the website lean makes me think it's more of a kids oriented thing like the first like the easy level is for kids up to 10 years old Um, yeah okay so it depends i guess it depends on which one they they send yeah see which version they send you but uh but i mean hey if the girls can get into it too that would be oh yeah uh, that'll be awesome yeah Uh, because i think the exit because i think the exit room box were a bit were a bit rough for the kids or would have been a bit rough for the kids. I, you know what? We still have one that's a level two uh, sitting behind me. That that was my goal was to try at least with um, with Grace, maybe both kids. We'll see, but at least with the oldest for sure because she's definitely old enough, right? Possibly with both of them. <laughs> so that 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 was something to do when I when we find time. <laughs> so I said, uh, unfortunately, we are not in the in the we are stuck at home and bored with nothing to do state. We are stuck at home just as busy as we were before, if not busier. So right. Wow, sorry, just uh, distracted. Uh, uh, Hamilton has just shut down Wild Water Works and banned all fireworks uh, until July, July, and shut down the the uh, city run uh, wave pool and and uh, slide thing for the summer, that like for the year. Been shut down before. Well, it, it yeah, but well, they haven't even opened for the season yet. Okay, but now they're just we're not. Um, huh? <laughs> uh, sorry to hear, Mountain Papa. Yeah, everyone's having the internet problems tonight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the local, like we have, I've never even been in. I've been in it, in the lobby, because they participate in Free Comic Book Day. Because that's something awesome. Rose Gallery Comics is just smart, right? Like, there's Free Comic Book Day. Everyone knows about Free Comic Book Day. Well, they're downtown, so they actually get a hold of other local downtown businesses and give each of these businesses a box of free comics. So you have to go around all the different businesses to get the comics, which is brilliant of them, right? So I've been in, I can't even remember what it's called splash something no see i don't know we have a big water park in windsor now well indoor water park with with like you know you can surf and there's water slides and a wave pool and all that stuff and i've only literally been in to get free comics adventure bay thank you tech i'm like i (laughs) never went there neither of my kids um they've now taken swimming lessons at school but we're competent swimmers right so they weren't comfortable going and i'm not going to force them to no no if they're not comfortable like water slides even if it's like shallow at the right. bottom. So 
because we we took them to uh, one of the biggest water parks in the world at Universal Studios, and they they basically splashed around in like the most basic pools, and there's like a big playground equipment area with water spraying everywhere, and that's what they did the whole time, which was fine. But yeah, we like the wave pool freaked them out, so yeah. bringing them to Adventure Bay just didn't seem worth it. Yeah, no, absolutely. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best ways for questions come through the website. We're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Today, we've got a question from Owlbear who writes... What are your thoughts on other game experience enhancing products? Sound, music for the ears, candles for the scent, game-related snacks? Well, thanks for the question, Owlbear. I hope the chicks are doing well. Now, this is a topic we've touched a bit on in the past. Uh, some parts of it we've actually discussed in some detail, but other parts not at all. Even for the stuff we've covered in the past, though, like sound at the table, it's been well over a year now at this point, so I think it's worth covering again. Now, I think the best way to cover this is to break down Owlbear's question to some different sections, so I do want to start with some overall thoughts on game enhancers or game night enhancers. And that's mainly that I am a huge fan of game experience enhancements of all kinds. I love anything that increases the feeling of immersion when playing a game. Now, this is true of both board games and RPGs. Things that help me forget I'm playing a game and instead make me feel like I'm having an experience are always positive to me. People set the mood with lights and surround sound for a movie. Some people are now even using the motion chairs and water squirting <laughs> setups in some theaters. Why should you expect any less from your game experience? Now, I bet we don't go so deep as to get into sensory chairs. I don't know if anyone's game room has gone that far yet or if that's even technology you can put in your home. But the thing is, and I think that might be an instance, is the caveat to all this about I, I love game enhancing experiences is that it can be taken too far. I love things that increase immersion but hate things that pull me out of the game. Things that remind me that I'm back in the real world sitting in a game room. So using game enhancing products I find is a balancing act. The key may be to make sure the game itself is still the focus. So you're still there to play a game and the outside things that keep people focused on the game are good and things that distract you from the game are bad. Just because you're walking through the bog of eternal stench in the game doesn't mean you need to really drive that experience home to your players outside of the game mechanic. Now, getting back to Owlbear's question, let's start breaking down this into sections. Up first, Owlbear mentions sound. All right, so this is the one we definitely uh, looked at before. We took a pretty deep dive into music and sound effects at the game table way back September 2018. Uh, that was literally episode eight of our podcast. And back then, I think we were doing, I was writing the article before and then doing the podcast, but like this is going way back. Um, now, I don't want to go into as much detail as we did then because we had a full episode on it and you're welcome to check that out. But I will say, uh, just to summarize, I will say that I think audio can be one of the best ways to enhance your game night. It can be a fantastic for enhancing role-playing games. And and I actually really grew to love having background music or ambiance on in the background when playing board games. Those who check out some of our AP videos, like our Gloomhaven series, will often note audio in the background. Though, for those, we do need to be very cautious of copyright issues. Yeah, very true. Now, the one source of background music and audio I continue to return to, and this is one that I talked about back in 2018 and I still use, um, as Sean mentioned, during Gloomhaven. I use this every Gloomhaven live stream, and that is a website called Tabletop Audio. This site has all kinds of soundscapes covering pretty much every genre. Like you've got your Cthulhu, you've got your sci-fi, you've got space opera, you've got spaceports, you've got halfling kitchens, just a ton of different settings, pretty much everything you can imagine. Uh, and it all works just at a touch of a button. You can use the site 100% free or you can back their Patreon. And what that does is give you a wider variety of options. Almost every soundscape they have, they also have a Patreon version of which is just to give you more options. As far as I understand, it's not like it's better quality or more sounds and it just more options, basically doubles your options. And remember that if you're not streaming, you've yeah. got a huge range of options available to you. There's nothing wrong with using copyrighted music for a home mm -hmm. game, but it's just not allowed on videos. Yeah. I, I personally, I do like having, um, 
something like tabletop audio so you're sticking away from licensed things people will recognize. But we'll get into why in just a bit. Now, if you're just looking for sound effects, uh, another site, this is a, more an app, something you can download, something you can get on your phone or on desktop is a site called or a uh, program called Sirenscapes. Now, they can do ambience as well. And their ambiance is well done because it's a bunch of sliders. Like how often do you want to hear chains and how often do you want screams and how often do you want the dripping water? So that's kind of neat. But personally, I find it's a little too much work where I'd rather just put on tabletop audio for the background. But what Sirenscape does well is sound effects that you can click buttons on. And the neat part is you can also use those same sliders and put them on repeat, right? So you can do like a sword swing and an orc grunt and put it on repeat. Now you have a battle against the orcs going on. And then when the wizard casts fireball, you click the little fireball button and you get a big whoosh sound, right? Uh, the drawback here is um, that you can get Sirenscape free, but you, there's, you don't want to, to be honest. Uh, you can basically get the generic fantasy, the generic sci-fi, or the generic board game, because yes, there is a Catan, Sirenscape, where every time someone trades in their wood for sheep, you can click a button to hear a ba or a sound of chopping wood. It does exist. I've got a copy of that one. Uh, but normally you have to buy uh, sets and it's not a subscription model. It's you have to buy. So if you want the space voyage set, you pay for the space voyage set. If you want the fa fantasy chaos battle set, you buy this fantasy chaos battle set. Uh, so it's not, I, I kind of wish it was a one time, just get access to everything. But as far as I know, there is not. Now, there are drawbacks to sound use as well, which we kind of hinted at. For one, it takes effort. Not only sourcing it, getting it ready to play, figuring out what goes where if you're setting up a soundboard and how you're going to use it and, and planning that out so you're not forgetting about it as you're going through whether it's the board game or, or your you know GM screen or whatever. Uh, and then on top of that, you need to make sure it's not too loud for the people right in front of you and too quiet for the people at the other end of the table. Uh, Beyond that, one of the problems you run into is if you're running into a, an ambient sound of some sort, they all mm -hmm. loop at some point, right? There's, there, it's usually only a, a certain length of, mu of music that's played on. Now, if you're playing a four-hour game of Gloomhaven and you've got one ambience track going, mm -hmm. people are probably going to notice, hey, wait a second, didn't we just hear that? Uh, you know, unless it's a long enough clip. So that's something, yeah. if you're going to be playing for a long time, either change up your ambient tracks, depending on mm -hmm. where you are in the game, or choose something that's got a long enough repeat time that you forget what it sounds like yeah. by the time you get, by the time it starts again. Now that is one place where Sirenscape is an advantage because it's procedurally generated background music. So it does not repeat. Yeah. So they do have that, but it does have a limited number of sounds. Like you're going to yeah. hear the same sounds, but they're not going to be in the same order. Uh, now again, so soundtracks are one of those things that we mentioned, you know, uh, if you're not running a stream, if you're not recording video, you can use copyrighted content for your own game use, you know, the, yep. that you own. So if you are storming the Mount Doom, to, Mount Doom, and you're with your hobbits, you can play the soundtrack to yep. uh, Lord of the Rings. But if everyone likes that movie or hates that movie, or some people <laughs> love it and some people hate it, you're going to get people who are maybe triggered by that music, and you're going to get discussions outside of the game involving regarding the movies or whatever content you're playing that can distract from what you really are trying to do, which is the game yeah. itself. And again, we don't want things that are distracting from that game. Uh, we want things that are going to help immerse you further in the game. Yeah. You don't want someone sitting there. Go, oh, I love this song. Right. Like that right then is going to pull you out of it or, Oh, this is the part where the orcs sieged Mordor. And remember that scene? You don't want that to happen. Yeah, absolutely not. You want, you want it to, uh, again, you want it to be in the background, but not noticeable essentially. Uh, yeah. the ideal, I, the ideal ambient music is there. Um, it's, it's sort of the concept of elevator music in the first place. The only problem with elevator music is there's nothing to distract you. Whereas you should have a game going on in front of you that should be keeping people focused. <laughs> Um, right. not standing around with a, you know, you know, twiddling your fingers in an elevator. Fair enough. All right. Moving on to scent. Now this is one we have not covered before, but a game enhancing thing that I gotta admit, I am really curious about this. This is something, uh, since I first heard about it, I've, I've been, I don't know, obsessed isn't the right word because I haven't gone all the way and done it yet, but definitely I, I want to experience. I want to try this. I want to see more done with this. Because what I have done, I've done the basic thing, right? Where you you light some incense, whether that's before everyone shows up, 
or in the middle, like I've had it where they're visiting the wizard in the wizard's tower. And I walk around the table while I'm playing, you know, Morton Kanan. And at the time I light some incense and put it in there. And that definitely does work. Like it works. Like it, you get that impact. You get that. I'm now in a wizard's thing. Cause I smell weird scents in the room or uh, stuff like that. Now, I haven't gone beyond that, right? Like I've just done the, the like I said, the, the very basic. I think I've used some lightly scented candles before too. Uh, but nowadays, there are companies out there that produce tabletop scents, like actual gaming scents. And man, the options are crazy. Like you've got your Alchemist Lab, but you also have the, you know, horse dung for in the the um, stables. And you've got the the sewers for the, when you're going to fight those giant rats that don't exist down there. Uh, there are a number of them. Uh, there's just fragrances and there's also candles. Now I haven't seen anything that's scentsy like, but I'm sure there are. Um, now I have checked these out at cons and like I've looked at them and they tend to come in little silver, uh, like not Petri dishes, but these, I don't know what you call them. Little silver containers where you screw the cap off and you can smell it. And they're like little rubbery beads. And, I, I don't know, like they, they're neat. The smells are good or bad. Like they're, they're appropriate, I guess is probably the first term, but I've never actually taken the plunge and bought any and brought any home. Cause for one, they're not cheap. Now this for one personally to me seems cringy, but then I actually haven't experienced it. So I'm yeah. willing to have my mind changed. If, uh, if someone can give me the, uh, the fun experience that it adds. Yeah. That, that what people say, and I've definitely know it's true. Like I, I I've experienced myself is it scent is the most, uh, the sense is most tied to memory and can have the most powerful emotional impact. Uh, just let me walk into the Windsor pizza bar or the, and, and immediately I'll, you know, there's, there's certain memories that come back and there's definitely certain smells that, that just flood of memories come in. Right. So I think making use of scent during a game is brilliant. Now, I don't know as much in a board game to me, it's more of a role-playing experience to me than, than a board game. I don't know what I'd want to smell while playing a board game. I guess some farm smells where we're playing Catan is going to make me feel more immersed. I don't know. Most board games are so abstract. I, I think this is more of a role-playing thing. Uh, the problem, though, I've seen is any of the scents I've actually smelled at a con, you basically had to hold the thing under your nose, right? It wasn't enough to fill the room. So what would happen is whatever scene I'm describing in my role-playing game and trying to immerse everyone, and I suddenly have to pause and go, here, smell this, and have everyone pass around this little jar, which to me is going to completely break that sense of immersion. Now I'm sniffing a thing in front of me, and I'm no longer thinking about what my character is doing. This is similar to your audio problem, of making sure it's not too loud or too quiet for that entire group. Uh, you've got the same issue. Yeah. Now, the other problem is I was thinking about this. If you did fill the room, so you go into the banquet hall and you fill the room with these awesome scents of food. And then while you move to the sewer and then like, how do you get rid of the food smell? Cause now you got food and sewer smell. And then you go to the wizard's lab and now the wizard's lab smells like Turkey and sewer and incense. Like I, I just, I, I, I can't like, it's just, how do you get rid of the scent? If you are going to fill a room, like the two are going to overlap and probably do some interesting things. Now, what I would like, think I would do, if I was going to actually use scents is I would save it for a pivotal scene and I would pick one scent, like one, here's my, my big boom. I'm going to, I'm going to throw this on the table. Everyone's going to do it. And well, actually under the table, what I'd like to do is my big boardroom table is, you know, un, uncap something under the table and then it would slowly fill the room. And I think that'd be great. Like something the players would pick up almost subconsciously at first and notice as the scene goes on. I, I don't know. I, like until someone comes up with a scent solution, I can do that too which isn't pass around this thing or light this votive candle and wait until it gets the effect. I think this is going to be more of a neat gimmick for most people. That said, if any companies out there are looking for someone to do a review of your products, I would love to try out some sense at my tables. I'm just not willing to make that initial money investment because I just, it seems like a gimmick to me. I'd love to be proven wrong though. Well, now I know in the special effects world for live entertainment, there are absolutely solutions out there but they're probably going to be overkill for most game rooms. And unfortunately they run a little pricey. That being yeah. said for about $60 Canadian, you can rent a machine that will solve yeah. your scent dispersion problems, which sounds amazing. And mm -hmm. now let me tell you, you can get anything as a scent from rotting human flesh to any flower you want or garden Valley. If you want to set a scene, they have, or can make a scent for it. 
Cool. The problem is that scent costs you three hundred dollars. Uh, now that's not a one use scent. You can seal them up in a, and 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 reuse them. So you could buy some for a campaign, but you still have oh, to be wow. pretty heavily invested in order to do that. But again, the technology is there. If you can afford okay, it. When, when I saw the ones I saw were expensive, I wasn't talking $300 <laughs> expensive. Uh, maybe you can look up actual prices, but if I remember it was in the, in the, in the double digits, but not the triple digits. So if people are interested in checking out Sense, um, the one company that seems to have made it, because it, for a little while it was like a bunch of these showed up at once and, you know, uh, cream roast to the crop. Adventure Sense is the one that seems to uh, have done the best. Uh, they tried to launch on their own, then they did a Kickstarter to increase the range of Sense. That's the one I, I've actually smelled myself and I've, I've held, I've touched. Um, and I've been curious to bring home. Uh, another one is Cantrip Candles. Those are the ones that are doing the whole scented candle thing. And another one is Dungeon Sense, which this one caught my eye because they do the tins, but they also do like votives. And I wonder if like a large votive would work better, especially if you could just like put it in the center of the table and not tell the group that it's going to produce scent. Like it's just, here's our centerpiece. You know, we light a candle for our game session. And then all of a sudden you start to notice whatever it is. Now, again, I have not tried any of these. I am curious to try any of these, but I haven't tried them myself. So these aren't like strong recommendations. This is what I've seen that's out there. Yeah. I mean, Adventure Sense for $15, you get a tin that they claim if you open it up, will fill the room quickly and dissipate if you close it up again. Uh, they're just little scent, scentsy bead type things, but there's yeah. no, there's no heating or anything necessary. It's literally okay. you just open it up and close it for 15 bucks. Um, and, and apparently they will do custom scents as well. So, you know, maybe it's worth it. Maybe it's worth it. I said, Hey, Adventure Sense, if you're listening, so I be really surprised if they were. Also, now, while it may go without saying, check with your players for sensitivities and be extra careful if you're using open flames or candles. Character sheets are very flammable. Yeah. Plus, I'm sure lots of other stuff in your game room probably is as well. Yeah. All right, next, we move on to taste. Now, personally, I found this part of the question a bit ironic. Uh, just because two days ago, Al Jam, a friend I have on Facebook, someone I interact with all the time from Cleveland, Ohio. We were supposed to meet up at Origins this year for the first time. I'm sad that's not going to happen. Anyway, he sent me a link to a company that is selling RPG branded or related beef jerky, or sorry, jerky, I shouldn't say beef jerky, called Mythical Meats. Uh, I actually tried to order the sampler pack, but unfortunately they don't ship to Canada. Uh, this sampler pack included things like unicorn and phoenix meat for your trail rations, uh, which was smoked beef and beef and pheasant, respectively. Because unicorns are endangered, folks, and we do not support the slaughter of endangered and mythical creatures, not even if it makes your game more tasty. Yes, even though the unicorns have returned to the plains of Africa, now that humans aren't out there, we still got to be careful not to overpoach. Having gaming-related food at the game night is something that for me goes back years. Like, I've always enjoyed tying food to my gaming, though interestingly, I don't like to play and eat at exactly the same time. More about that in a minute. But back in the old University of Windsor days, when I was part of the Windsor Gaming Society, I remember going with my friend Eugene and going to either Lowe's or Loblaws, whatever grocery store he worked at, and buying this, like, giant summer sausage. Like, this thing was, I don't know, three feet long and, like, half a thick foot thick and getting this and because we were going to play this massive warhammer campaign where they were on the road and eating rations all the time and he brought off uh like this fancy conan knife with him and we were like cutting off chunks of the summer sausage and eating it while playing warhammer because that's obviously that's what our characters ate was summer sausage but to be fair <laughs> we had a lot during in those days during gaming yeah. it was just that taco bell wasn't on theme with the games except i don't know maybe cyberpunk yeah, I don't think I don't think any of our games were tied well to the Big Bite hot dog from uh, 7-Eleven, though I think Jolt was pretty close to Bouncy Bubbly Beverage from uh, Paranoia, or at least Happy Fun, if nothing <laughs> else. Now, the thing with food at game night is making sure you're following game night food etiquette. Now, this is a topic we covered uh, quite some time ago again, back in January 2019. Now, the main point we tried to make back then, and again, I will reiterate now, is that you need to make sure you're protecting the games while you're eating. Now, this can be done by separating the snacking and eating from the games, by eating before or after or taking a eating break instead of playing while you're eating, which is actually my preferred method, uh, but also making sure to avoid greasy, sticky, powdery foods, as well as making sure your games themselves are protected 
for when the inevitable Dorito fingers do get to your cards by doing things like sleeving. And once more, watch out for allergies. Your mermaid adventure could be brought up short if one of your players badly reacts to the shell shellfish. Yes, you don't want to play that one out at the table. Now, one thing I really enjoy doing that can help with immersion is to tie the food you're eating to the game. So, for example, you are playing a fantasy game and you're at the local tavern putting out some kind of charcuterie board covered in meats, dried breads, and cheeses can be a great touch. Now, personally, um, I subscribe to something called the Carnivore Club. Now, this is a monthly source of meat where they send you dried, cured, seasoned meats, uh, the type you'd have on a charcuterie board, that I think are great to represent rations or a medieval tavern fare. Now, if you're playing something Asian, say, or Japanese-themed, like Legend of the Five Rings, maybe it's time to serve some ramen. Now, if you're going to go with pot noodles, you know, you're, you're just Mr. Noodles, at least add some ramen eggs or two. Uh, we'll drop a link to the recipe for those. And yes, I know, it's anachronistic. Ramen was only invented in Japan 100 years ago. But you know what? Legend of the Five Rings fantasy anyway. So I just love ramen. So if I have an excuse to eat ramen, I'm going to go with it. Now, a couple things to keep in mind with food. Uh, make sure you have enough, right? Uh, you don't want to be the, the person who's like, maybe if you got your own, like, you know, pepperoni sticks or something as a snack, that's a little different. But if you're going to do the whole, make an event, right? Make sure there's enough food for everyone. And watch for dietary preferences and restrictions. You don't want to show up with too little food for everyone to take part. And you want to make sure that everyone has something present that they can and will eat. Now, one sense that Albert didn't mention is sight. And enhancing yeah. game night immersion through lighting is something that Mo has been experimenting with for a few night years now with mis mixed success. Yeah, this is like, I love the idea. The first time, I don't remember where it was. It was back, uh, I think it was before G+. It was a blog post. I think it was on the old Grog Nordia uh, blog, which is one of the best role-playing blogs that's ever existed. Sadly, now done. Uh, the writer has stopped writing. And that was to use lighting during your games using uh, programmable lights. At the time, Philips Hue was what I owned. Like, can you imagine when your group goes underwater to visit the Mer King and all of a sudden the light starts shifting between blues and greens? Or I've done it where I'll have the room suddenly go dark and then they begin to flicker on and off. Or one of my favorite scenes I ever did was there was a goblin, a mad goblin druid or shaman in Warhammer uh, fantasy role play who was casting spells. And every time he cast a spell, I turned the lights all green. Now, these were really cool, but you know what? Most of the time they took players out of the game instead of immersing them further. Uh, as with any of these things, distraction can be a problem. Yeah, see the problems I've found with fiddling with lighting is for one, it's not easy to do on the fly. It wasn't something I could just have timed and happen. I had to grab my phone. I had to open the appropriate app. I had to load the appropriate scene. I had to start the appropriate scene. And the other thing is I never found anything, at least for the Philips Hue, and I tried a slew of different apps that was good for quickly switching between scenes or more importantly, just going back to normal lights, which leads me to the biggest problem we had is that when the lights are off or flashing or shifting between blues and greens, it's really hard to see your game components, whether that's your hand of cards in a, in a, in a board game, seeing the board pieces, or reading your character sheet. Yeah, there are a lot of control options out there. I actually have one button touch control of my overhead lights here in the office. I have been playing with them a bit, but because of the, the front light on me, it, it's pretty hard to see. I'd have to turn them down because it's not a bright uh, it's right. not a bright lighting system I have in here, but it wasn't easy. And my solution ended up using a stream deck connected to a computer program, connected to the wireless hub, connected to the wireless lights. Wow. Yeah. And see? it just, yeah, it's great, but I don't want to set that up again to go through for the, for a game, I'd have to rebuild, you know, build all those scenes and it would be just as difficult as building yeah. up that soundboard for, you know, the sound portion. Yeah, see, I, I had really high hopes. Like I had spent, I, buy, I bought the high end. I bought the Philips Hue, which is the, 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 the big name brand version. And I got to admit, nowadays, I almost never use it for doing anything cool. Uh, now, I will use it for that special encounter, right? That epic battle, the 
center of the board. You're about to take over Mechatol Rex, whatever it happens to be the big boss fight. Uh, but then I just I make sure I only have the one scene set up and it's ready to go. It's ready to play. And I just hit the thing on my phone and it goes and it works. But anything more complicated than that is just too much work. Now, as an example of this in Star Wars Edge of the Empire, there was a particular scene where the players were trying to take off on a ship and all kinds of malfunctions were going wrong. So for one, there was a horrible smell. And here's where I would have loved the table sense. There was a klaxon going off and there were bright flashing red lights. And the point was the players were supposed to be freaking out and stressing out and not being able to see their character sheets at that time was perfect. That just immersed it even more. And they had to deal with the ship that wasn't working for them. So it was awesome for that. But then I didn't use it again for the rest of the Star Wars campaign because it just nothing else came. But that particular scene went great. So it's got to be really limited. Now, unfortunately, while the concept of the hue and similar systems is fantastic and their potential is remarkable, lighting control is a bit harder than most people expect sometimes. Yeah. I've literally made a career of controlling lighting for events yeah. and shows and things. So, you know. It, it's not something that people should necessarily expect to be able to make wow magic happen out of the yeah. box. Yeah, when I when I read about how it worked compared to the actuality and it just didn't live up. Now, what might work, and I was just thinking about this now, I'm going off, off our notes here, is if you had a stage director, if you were DMing and you had someone else that all their job was is to do the immersion stuff, I bet you it would work. With the sense and everything. Yep. Like if you had, like I said, basically a stage director who was sitting there with a laptop, with the hue open, with a stream deck and everything else, it would probably work. So you could probably make for a fantastic con game yep. or, or special event. But like while trying to DM a game and run all the NPCs and move the minis on the map and like, or you're playing a board game, no one's going to want you to do that when it's your turn. Right, like you're playing Terraforming Mars and you got the Terraforming Mars soundtrack on and you got the shifting red lights going on and then you're like, oh, I got to switch the soundtrack before it repeats. And no, just take your dang turn, right? Like yeah. you don't want it to interfere there. Yeah, no, it, it realistically, I mean, uh, if you look at something like... Um uh, some of the, some of the streams online, you know, some of the big, the big D and D streams, yes. you know, they have a producer behind the scenes, you know, they have someone who's doing a lot of the camera switching and stuff like that. And that's no different than what you yeah. almost, you need for, you know, any of these, you know, effects, you know, they're at, at a show, there is someone in charge of special effects and someone in charge mm -hmm. of lighting and someone in charge of audio and someone in charge of video, uh, because you know, the band leader doesn't want to have to do all that stuff. Exactly. Now, what I will say, I do appreciate having my program over lighting, and I do like that. And that is just for making things easier to see when playing games in general. Uh, in particular with the Hue, there are two settings. One is Focus, the other is Concentrate. And I find both of those really good for board games that have pieces that are close in color or games with small text. What these settings do is they enhance the contrast of everything in the room. For example, I can't play Raiders of the North Sea without like with just standard lighting on because I cannot tell the gray meeples from the black meeples. I have literally had to pick them up, held them both my hand and go, okay, yeah, that's a gray or black. Whereas if I set my lighting to concentrate, I can tell them apart from across the table. So that is the one thing where I do really appreciate still having my lights. Yeah. And this is where Hugh shines. It's the most small adjustments that you can make between games to go over the long haul uh, rather than, you know, some brief, brief flashy stuff. Yeah. All right, so at this point, we've covered scent, taste, hearing, and sight. So the only scent we're missing is touch. Now, we're not going to deep dive this one, but just thinking about touch, I couldn't help but think of a game that came out in 2018 that I just I, I think is groundbreaking in a way, very unique, and it's called Nyctophobia. Uh, this is a cooperative murder mystery where you're basically, um, you know, Jason's trying to catch you while you're out the lake. And it does something really interesting with touch because what happens is players wear blackout glasses and cannot see the board and then have to rely on touch to navigate their way through the camp to try to escape. And then there is also a two player version where there's a vampire hunter, there's a vampire chasing you and you have to escape. And I'm, I want to try this game. This is something I was looking forward to seeing at origins this year. And unfortunately without going, I'm not going to get to see it. It's not something I plan on buying on my own just cause I'm like, it's so out there, but just a game that is literally based on, on not being able to see and relying only on touch to be able to play. And then thinking about that, I was got a flashback to a couple games my kids had. 
one that we brought up many times on the show, which is Laundry Jumble. Now, this was a kid's game, a preschooler game, where the kids had to reach into this, like, fabric uh, laundry washing machine. Sorry, that's the word. Washing machine. And pull out the appropriate piece of laundry. And all the different pieces had different textures. And, of course, there were some similar textures, so it was kind of hard to tell. And that's another one where it relied on touch. And then another was Master Fox. Master Fox has you take a box and you put on a, a blindfold, which makes you look like a fox. And then you have to try to find the appropriate meeple. But the thing is, you might have to find, like, say, the hedgehog, which is, of course, spiky. But the snake's also spiky because it's in a zigzag pattern. So it's trying to figure out the exact meeple to pick up. And I just thought it was really neat to see board games that are so focused on touch as a thing. And it's not definitely not common. Like, Nitophobia is, like, blows my mind as a modern hobby board game using it. Whereas the kids games are just trying to differentiate between, you know, spiky, soft and crinkly, which I thought was pretty cool. And then of course, uh, people have been adding the element of touch to their RPGs for years, in my opinion, uh, through creating props, right? Like who hasn't touched a tea soaked piece of paper that's supposed to represent the puzzle map or been handled a puzzle box, or, you know, here's your, uh, costume jewelry or your plastic gems to represent your money, your metal coins and all those things that add a tactile feel to your role-playing games. So for those of us who have watched Dune, we may not be interested in those games where you're blindly reaching out and touching things. <laughs> That's true. You could always do the RPG thing, the Halloween thing too. I've, I've yet to see anyone do it in an RPG, but I could totally see the, you know, put your hand in here. Oh, that's orc guts. You know, like, there's a, I definitely remember going to those haunted houses as a kid where you did that thing with a yeah, put I, your hand in the blind. See, I saw, I saw, I saw uh, Dune pretty early because even at the uh, at the Toronto Science Center, I wouldn't put my hand into boxes I couldn't <laughs> like, see into. I've never been, I've never done it. Wow. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it for our thoughts on game experience enhancing products for tonight. We're gonna head over to the lobby now and see if the awesome folk gathered there have anything to add. Uh, so, uh, Angie Games is mentioning post pandemic, uh, she's going to start bringing you blindfolded to Windsor restaurants to see if you can tell the location by the oh. scent. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. There's certain <laughs> ones. I'm pretty sure I could. There's certain ones. Like I remember the smell of the old Sam's and the new Sam's does not have that smell. And walking in there, I get the memory of the absence of that smell. Right. Like I just walk in and I'm like, no, this doesn't smell like Sam's. And every time I go in there, it still doesn't smell like Sam's because that place had that flower pizza plate. Like, yep, you yep. could definitely smell the flower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was that, that, it was that sort of, of cooking flower uh, scent. Yeah, um, there was, a, there was a, a flower scent. And apparently, uh, is saying that there is a vampire hunter retheme of Nyctophobia. Yeah, that's the, like I said, the two player version. It's a slightly cheaper version. Now, both of those games were released as Target exclusives, which is one of the reasons I haven't gotten a chance to see them. Because, well, no one local, there's no Targets here in Canada. So yeah. we didn't get to check that game out. I want to play that one. I want to try it. Now, I see Deanna asking, would you bring your own lighting to a con game? Uh, yeah, I guess I you could. <laughs> I mean, I would, but that's because I do that the uh, problem is if you're doing that you need a private room like you're not going to do yeah. that in the hall filled with 20 rpg tables and they just put some yeah, spotlights no. on your table no you, you definitely have to have your your room this would be that'd be something you'd be th considering more for your larp type experiences yeah. uh you know if you're trying that new larp uh the, the save the world one aliens invasion sort of thing that that happens yeah, at yeah. breakout um definitely that and, and sense especially yes you could not use sense in a crowded gaming hall well uh, you could you, do the pass it around thing but i uh, personally don't think that's that cool yeah i mean because <laughs> i get you know adventure sense has those satchets where you can yeah. you can just patch the pass the little pillows around but uh yeah that's, like, so that's once, tough. once you're passing something around now it's not increasing immersion it's going to be a neat thing it's like oh i can spell the wizard's lab it's neat it'd be a neat gimmick but that's not going to increase my immersion yeah. No, Whereas absolutely. if I'm sitting there and like I said, the DM lights a candle in the room and then slowly you get that, whatever that, that acrid, you know, there's, there's spices in the air smell yep. that I think would work. Right. Yeah. It's really I, realistically. I mean, a lot of what we're talking here is very involved. So you've got two yeah. choices. You can add this to your game prep. So you can, while you're prepping your adventure, prep a soundboard and prep your hue scenes and the control system for that and you know figure out that control system in advance. But you're talking about, you know, doubling 
your adventure prep time. Uh, At least. And if you've got the time for that, that's great. Um, and I say doubling, it, it, yeah, it's going to be more the first time, but once you've got a system like anything else, you'll probably be able to, you know, adjust it for, uh, for each different adventure more quickly. But yeah, that first time is going to be tough. I don't I like the, I, the more I think about it, I'm like, you know where this would be good is nowadays more and more people are paying for an RPG experience. Yep. And I think if I did say, start running games in my basement. And charging people to play, I might go through this extra work. But that would be a very prepped game, especially if I was running. Like, I, I wouldn't be improv much. I would make sure it's well scripted and everything else, right? Because I need to make sure that they're having a good time, right? Like, I, I'd, I'd be trying to get – it all be worked in, right? I, yeah. I'm not going to show up to – Someone's paying, I don't even know what people pay for these things, but someone's paying to play in my basement. I'm going to do a probably a pretty railroady scripted adventure that I expect to be fun versus, all right, what do you guys want to do tonight, right? Or you folk want to do yep. tonight. So in that case, I would have the time for that prep. And I think it'd be worth it, right? Like I, I think prepared properly, except the hue. Like I, every time I tried to do anything cool with the hue, I fought with it. Yeah. Like every time, like whether it was the app or it wouldn't connect, the bridge wouldn't connect or I'd switch the scene and it didn't switch. And like there is an app out there that I thought was fantastic. And this is one of the ones that was recommended when I bought the Hue where it listens to your speaker and the louder you get, the brighter the lights get. And I'm like, that sounds awesome. So I did this thing where I was playing a goblin and the louder I got, the more green it got, except those lag. Right. So it just didn't work, right? Just yeah. with that little bit of lag, I'm like, you're not getting the effect. I'm like, yeah, green's going up and down in the room. So I kind of got that impact, but I didn't have the more upset the goblin got, the more green the room got, which is the effect I wanted. Yeah, so I'm actually using, uh, my solution has been uh, Hutro, H-U-E-T-R-O for Hue, which is a Windows Store app. Um, okay. And and that's, that's what I've been using to control it. I can't, I'm on and then... Phone. It turned out it was easy enough to link that in to uh, some control uh, functions on on the stream deck. Right. Um, but again, you know, not everyone has a uh, you know hundred fifty dollars stream deck, and yeah. not all of the functions of Utro are. I'm only using the free functions, but if you want yes. some of the more effecty ones, if you want to get into the the flashing mm -hmm. disco stuff, well, that was it too. Yeah. yeah, that's that. Those all cost and right. For I, some reason, they are not cheap. They are not app priced. Right. Yeah. They're, they're not like I can get full board games for way cheaper than some of these Hue <laughs> apps. Yeah. And I'm like, come on. And and not there's no demos, so you can't tell what they could do. So I did the the best one I found at the time, and I have no clue. This was on Apple though. Was Houdini, and that let I actually paid for that, and that let me do multiple scenes. But it was really bad for switching scenes because you literally had to go into your current scene and tell it to stop before you started the next one, or they would overlap. Okay. And they would both be running and trying to take over your lights. So you would have to go into the one and stop it. Then you would have to open up the other one and hit play, which is just enough time that you're now taking everyone out of the game. Right. right? Like it's it's that. And then there's that moment in between where the lights are off. So yep. like you just you don't get the transition. And that was one of the best apps I had. And I'm like, again, it's great. And like I could, you could set up strobes, you could set up cycles, you could set up all kinds of really neat stuff. And I did, that's where I, I did my goblin chanting thing. I had one where there was a thunderstorm and it, I made it so different lights would flicker at different times, but there was always one on so the players could always see. Right. And it worked. It worked great. But I had to program that in Houdini. Right. And, and again, if I wanted to switch something else, it was garbage. But if I just put that on, I'm like, Eric, hey, you're in a storm. Well, and I that had to do with players escaping a burning building in a thunderstorm, which is a Warhammer adventure. Many people have probably played rough night at the three feathers. So yeah, I have to say, uh, the Hutro it's, uh, I think it's six bucks Canadian for the, for the premium, yeah, uh, which isn't horrible. Um, again, I only right now want single color stuff. I don't, yeah. you know, if I want to flash, I'll set up a bunch of different buttons on my thing and manually hit the buttons. Uh, yeah. but it's not something I want. It's, you know, I, I use it for lighting. I use it to enhance the green screen. If we're doing, if we're yep. doing some gaming stuff, um, you know, it makes the green screen pop a little better on camera. And, well, and that's it. That's what it's really good for. Like I am using a hue light right now that I turned down the, the yellow a bit to get more white and, that way it's got that. Yeah. I, I look so much better than three weeks ago <laughs> now that I've moved that and adjusted it. And I remembered to put it up on like at the beginning of the show. Right. Like, I don't even know if we can, if I can, if, if I can get this to, to, to show. Um, well, it doesn't matter for yeah, but, the podcast yeah. anyway. 
It's uh, you know there's 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 light, but yeah, it's it's so dim against all my uh, broadcast lights that you can't even really notice. They say if you if you read our original, I think it's our tech on the table article. I really like praise the hue lighting, and just over time, I I no longer praise it as much. Plus, I have two bulbs that are already dead, and it hasn't yeah. been that long. Yeah, like they're supposed to last like a ridiculous number of hours, and they are not. So uh, what I'm actually doing, and and one thing one thing I've done to to get around some of the problems you've run into with bulbs is I'm actually using LED strip. So I'm actually right. using the the flexible strip lighting. Um, and it's not hue actually, uh, but I've got a yeah. hue gateway that brings it into the hue family. Uh, again, I, I, I did a bunch of DIY stuff sort of to, to make it work. Um, and I found that stuff is pretty tough to, to beat up and I expect it to last longer than the really expensive hue bulbs, even though they're really expensive. Yeah. The hue, I'm, I'm disappointed that they're back there there's two those yeah. two hue bulbs are toast one of them doesn't show yellows like so it's only part of the leds are dead right and the other one flickers and so now i just put standard led bulbs over now that's over by my tv so i can still technically do all the game room stuff but right plus they're not bright is the other problem i have with them like as you can tell from this one when you were here when we were playing with the blooms they just don't produce enough light like it's not even enough to reflect off the ceiling yeah i know just don't well, the bloom, the bloom ex uh, especially are, are designed yeah. for that morning wake up type sort of well, they're scenario. Well, they're supposed to also do like room, like, hey, this corner of my room's red and this corner is blue. And right. I was hoping it would more fill my game room with greens and blues when we're underwater. And I find they, they just, I almost wish I never bought them. Like they're just, the, the yeah. bulbs give so much more brightness that I'd rather just set a bulb out on the table <laughs> somehow. Yeah. All right. All right. We got anything else in the lobby? I don't see too much. Uh, welcome, Poncho. I think that's. Uh... I, I hope I run a pretty good game. I try, <laughs> try to make my games immersive. All right. Finally, if you got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email directly at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Oh, my eyes bugging me. Up next, a look at King Me, a family weight game based on checkers or drafts. Uh, Kami was designed by Prospero Hall. No, that's not one person. It's a development team and published by Ravensburger in 2019. Plays with only two players and the game takes under an hour. Um, I think Board Game Geek says 45 minutes. I think I finished in under half an hour as well. Uh, the time is very much, though, based on how much thinking time the players take, much like in an actual game of checkers. All right, well, to see what you get with a copy of King Me, check out our unboxing video over on YouTube. I had some help with this one, so I think this one's worth checking out. I personally think it's kind of cool because uh, we picked up this game from Ravensburger for my youngest birthday, and I actually had her help me with the unboxing video. So you guys should get to see her thoughts on what the different components are like and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. Though I do apologize for uh, way too much brightness in the first half of the video. I didn't notice it right away. Now, I'm not going to go through all the components you get here. Uh, you can see that over on the blog or in the unboxing video, but I will say I was impressed by the quality of everything uh, from the plastic checkers that are actually unique. The red are different than the black. That's a nice touch. The mounted board, uh, the thick tiles, everything was top notch. Perfectly fine. No right. complaints. Well, so what is King Me all about? We know it's based on checkers. How are things different here? All right, well, in King Me, the black player is supposed to be a kingdom that's on the board, and the red player is supposed to be an invading army. Uh, the black pieces even have, like, a little castle on them where the red pieces have a boat, which is kind of neat. Uh, the board is checkered, so light and dark squares, and but it's divided up into a number of different regions and different sections of the board that are denoted by color and artwork. So, like, you'll have a black and gray area, you'll have a red and lighter red area, um, and they all look different. So, like, they're, they're kind of themed, like the red's volcanic or whatever. Uh, the board is completely symmetrical, which is kind of important. So, despite having different colors, there, there are an identical number on each half of the board. Now, players start with 12 checkers. Uh, they're placed on campsites, and this, again, is supposed to represent the two armies about to clash. Then you have a deck of adventure, ad, event cards that are shuffled and placed on the appropriate spot. So that's that's the, the basic setup. Uh, just like checkers, the red player starts. All right, well, with different areas and cards, we're certainly veering well away from a common game of drafts. Yeah, it is definitely definitely a different game. So first off, one of the biggest changes is each turn you're going to move two pieces. Now, normally this is two different pieces, but one of your kings, if you have a king, can be moved twice in a row. 
Movement is what you'd expect from checkers with diagonal only. Though in King Me, any checker can be moved in any diagonal. You don't have to always go forward. And it's not just the kings that can go backwards. You can jump over your own pieces as well, which is a good way to move further or faster along the board. Plus, the board has some pre-printed checkers on it that you can jump over those as well. Well, it certainly sounds like a, a whole lot more additional complexity added in. All right. So when jumping, if you jump over an opponent's checker, you capture it. If you jump over an opponent's king, you get to steal their crown and make your piece a king. Now about the crowns. Now, instead of having to reach the opponent's edge of the board, there are four spots on the board that hold crowns, and each of them takes up two board pieces. And the first person to land in either one of those two squares gets to cake that crown and become a king. And it's neat. You flip your piece over and it actually snaps on, and the crowns are all different, unique looking, so the four crowns look different. I thought that's cool. Now, kings have the ability to move twice in a row, they break ties during scoring, which we'll get to a bit, and they count as two pieces for scoring, but only in three of the different terrain types. So each king specializes in three different terrain types. And of course, it's well laid out, so it's not near where you get the crown. They specialize in terrain types that are further away. Now, after your player takes your two moves, you then resolve the current event card, if there is any. This card is either going to show a river and a number um, or a terrain type. Now, on the board, I hadn't mentioned the rivers before. There are two circular rivers, one on the far left of the board, one on the far right. And any time a river card comes up as an event, all the checkers on the river are going to move clockwise around the board, one or two spaces. Now, the terrain type cards cause scoring. There's one terrain type card for each of the terrains on the board. Uh, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you how many. I'm going to guess about 12. Um, each card shows its terrain type identified by both color and symbol, like I mentioned before, like red or black. And then a number of points for each side. So what red scores may be different than what black scores. And that depends on how deep on the opponent's side of the board the terrain is. So for the terrain that's like right next to your starting area, it's going to score your opponent 20 points if they claim it. But you only get five if you claim it yourself as well it's right there next to you now to claim one of these we do a full uh area majority thing so it's whoever has the most checkers in that terrain type when the card's up wins and remember kings break ties and kings can also count as two checkers in their favorite terrain every terrain card also causes the rivers to move one spot so uh timed area majority scoring pretty straightforward enough yep pretty much after resolving the event card, all the cards in the event row slide down and a new card's revealed. The game ends after the last card in the deck is resolved, which is important because every terrain is going to score. Every game. So there's no random one spots out. Now at the end of the game, you're going to add up your points. So first off, you're going to get your points for your terrain tiles. You're going to get five points for every king you currently have at the end of the game and five points for every one of your opponent's pieces you've captured. Player with the most points wins. So, Checkers 2020, the game we knew, brought into the modern world of hobby gaming. Now, I have to say, Prospero Hall has really been knocking their products out of the park time and time again. Yeah, and th this is another example of it, because this is an awesome update to the classic game. Like, he takes the basic mechanics of Checkers and improves on them in many ways. For one, the ability to move all your pieces forward and backwards just like explodes the number of possible moves. You're, you're, you just got way more options. The ability to jump over not only the enemy, but your own pieces and those static ones in the board really gives you a lot of mobility. Like there's some really quick moves you can do to get across the board quickly. And then there's the whole diving into the river at the right time and trying to time that. But the biggest thing, though, that really improves in the game is it's not just about taking all of your opponent's pieces off the board. It's that area majority scoring mechanic. And to me, that's what makes the game shine. Yeah. So drafts or checkers, as we mentioned in the past episodes, is a solved problem. If you input a yes. starting uh, thing, there is a known solution to that problem or a calculable solution. Yeah. I personally love the strategy in this game. Now, strategy is long-term planning. That's, that's having to plan ahead. Um, what I'd like is that event row takes five turns before something's resolved. So you get to see it coming. And that gives you plenty of time to try to get your pieces into position and jockey for spots. Seeing how the river's going to move and then using those to get your pieces into the right spot can also be key to it. And then 
there's also some tactical thinking because you have to react to what your opponent's doing, which is just so much more than you're going to see in a checkers game. Right. It really takes it from being a straight gotcha conflict game to that whole other level of actual strategy. Yeah. Now, the best part about all this, despite being highly strategic and tactical, is it's also approachable. It's still basically checkers. Uh, this is dead simple to teach and play. Both my kids, um, now 8 and 12, perfectly got it. Like, not only they know how to play, but they, they can know how to play well they can see the strategy they can plan ahead they know how how to actually play it and actually my oldest is getting to be a bit of a ringer in this one um she's beaten me now more often than not so and this is also a simple enough game that the kids can break it out and play it on their own without myself or deanna having to teach watch or moderate in any way which is great yeah it's always a bonus when you can have a good solid game with real and not childish mechanics that the kids can and will play on their own yeah and they're loving it like they they are really enjoying it uh this morning um grace actually taught deanna how to play for the first time and was looking forward to teaching her mom a new game so that was pretty cool now i'll admit she was a little bummed out when she got destroyed by deanna for her first <laughs> game especially after beating me the other day but uh that that's something that happens I got to say, if you are a fan of checkers, just pick this up. Like, unless unless you love the purity of checkers and nothing should mess with my game checkers, like, which I'm sure there are checker fans out there. But if you enjoy a casual game of checkers, pick this game up. If you like abstract strategy games, you're probably going to dig this. This is a really neat... Yes, there's a theme here, but this is a neat evolution of it. If you like area majority, this is probably going to be a winner. Like, no, this is no El Grande, but for something simpler with that that whole, I need to get my pieces there and make sure I outnumber you, it's all right there. And if you're looking for games to play with the entire family, as well as something that, like, I could easily bring this out uh, with Charles, who is a, I don't know if he's a chess master, but, like, plays chess a lot competitively and probably have a great game of this with Charles. Not that I, I haven't had a chance. If we weren't in quarantine, I would totally play a game of this with Charles just to see how well he could do it. And I think we're both going to enjoy it just as much as I am going to playing with my kids. I think it's a great game to look if you are into looking for a game to play with, with, with family members as well as gamers. Now, unless you hate checkers, which, you know what? Uh, some people possibly do. I think everyone should at least try this game. Like I, to me, I have heard no buzz about this game. When 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 we went shopping for for Gigi's birthday, and I was looking at Ravensburger games, I had picked out Villainous and I had picked out Woodlands, and I was kind of like, I don't know, this came me game, I guess. And like I've heard nothing about this game. No one's talking about this game, possibly because it's a family weight game. And I will say it's it's not specifically a kids game. It is a family weight game. It's not aimed at kids. It's aimed at families. And like no one's talking about. It. I haven't heard anyone on a podcast talk about came me ever. And I think it's just getting completely overlooked. And I I think that's a shame. All right. Well, for a more in depth look at King Me, you can head over to the tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews. And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? All right. I've got a small handful of games to talk about this week, starting with some more untapped. Uh, I talked about this one last week, but again, we played this last Friday was uh, Deanna and I, my Dan and our hour it was our 15th wedding anniversary uh and of course we spent it with some good food good beer and some gaming would have been nice to do it out in kingsville like we usually do out at jack's gastro pub but that wasn't going to happen so we just did it here in our basement so earlier in the night one of the the, the first things we started off was breaking out unlabeled the blind beer testing game and i think we now have our official house rules for playing that game uh first off you play you take turns playing the game you don't both play it at once the other person will go pour the beer pour the drink without the other seeing what they've got right then you give that player who's playing four of the barrels which they're going to use to place bets they can bet in any category any number of times including the i know that beer in the center of the board now there are only four there are five different cat. Sorry, there are only four categories. So if you you only sorry, there are five categories. If you only use four beers, the if you choose the I know this beer, you're giving up points somewhere else. So you're really taking a bet there. But uh, otherwise, you're going to be voting on the fermentation type, so lager or ale, 
the ABV or alcohol level, the general type of beer, so like say India Pale Ale or Cream Ales, and then the exact type. So instead of just an India Pale Ale, that's actually an American Pale Ale, or instead of a Cream Ale, that's actually a um, uh, I'm totally blanking on types of Cream Ales right now, but whatever, a special type of Cream Ale. I don't know why I can't remember Cream Ales right now. It's a good thing I'm not playing Untapped. Uh, but then say you're not sure, you could bet two on another thing, right? So if you're like, really don't know, you're like, ah, I'm going to bet ALN Lager, that way at least I get a point. Or you could be like, oh, I think the ABV is almost six, but maybe it's seven, so I'm going to bet on both of those. Or I know it's an IPA or it's a cream ale, but I'm not sure which. So instead of betting on American Pale Ale, I bet on both of those. So it's just the way you can do it. That way, you re what's going to happen is you're not going to get the maximum points. It would be impossible, but it does increase your odds of scoring at all. So generally a more enjoyable game, especially for two players. Yeah. Now, BGG indicates, indicates that this is four to six is the better player count. Now, I wonder if, aside from the completely missing aspects, uh, <laughs> could your experiences partially be due to only playing a two-player? No, I don't think so. See, the problem is if I play four to six players, I'm now down to what we talked about last week where you only get that one bet. And I just don't think that's as much fun. Like, I, I really don't think I'd, I'd want, if I was playing with six people, I would go invest on, in more barrels. Well, I would just grab components from another board game or something. Uh, and I think you still need, like, uh, the host. You still need the one, like, if you have four to six people, five people would play, and that fifth person would be sitting and pouring the one drink. And then you'd rotate, and the next person would pour the drinks. Um, but it's that one bet. Like the game just is not fun with that one bet. It's just, it doesn't owe you to push your luck. Like it's just the only getting that you get points or you don't was not fun. Whereas this way you're probably going to earn one or two points. And if you nail it, you might get up to five. Right. So overall we found this really made the game for us. Like, yeah, there's still some issues. Uh, there are missing beer types. Uh, I can't remember what it was. There was one that came up uh, when we were playing the other night where the type of beer that we had did not exist on the board and there's no IBUs, which to me is just weird. Like IBUs are such a big thing in the craft beer industry. Your international bitterness units are like huge. That's, that's what all the, 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 the hipsters are into is how, how bitter is your beer? How can that not be in this game? To me, that's just wrong, but overall it was fun. Like we had a lot more fun this time. Um, I can't remember if we played three or four rounds. So, you know, I did a round and D did a round. I did a round and, and that was cool. So unlabeled going up in my opinion of it, but that's because we're breaking the rules. <laughs> we're, we're making up our own version. Right. Uh, next, we played a round of Eminent Domain with Exotica. Uh, this time we broke out the scenarios, and I got to say, they seem to really help the gameplay. Uh, now, the scenarios are a deck of cards you randomize. Every player gets one, and these make the game asymmetric by setting your starting hand of cards, making it unique, so it's not everyone gets two of every card in a warfare. But they could have completely different, like uh, Deanna's, I think, had five politics cards, so she could basically customize her deck to do whatever she wanted. Uh, it also gives you a set starting world, or at least says, like, take a random starting world from the base game, or take a random starting world from the original, or take a specific and then it gives you a starting set of technologies. And some of these cards give as many as four technologies. Now, like I said, this does add asymmetry, which everyone who listens knows I love. Uh, the other thing it does, though, is it shows you some of the combos that exist. Because the technologies they give you work together, which I thought was neat. So that was a good way to kind of show us ways to use the cards we hadn't thought of. But most importantly, especially I think in a two-player game, is it gave you a jump start. It did what Terraforming Mars Prelude does. It gives you a bit of an engine right from the get-go. And I love that because one of the problems, and we complained about this when we were reviewed Eminent Domain the first time and we re reviewed Escalation, is that with two players and four players, it feels like the game is over too quickly. Because the game with two players ends as soon as one roll pile is out. That can be quick. And it often feels like you never get your engine going. Whereas if you have your scenarios, you already have an engine at the start of the game. So we found both of us, Deanna and I found it to be a much more enjoyable game that way. Well, I'm looking forward to trying this and I took a look. They do have scenarios on board game arena. Mm. So we should spin up another game when we have the time to play real time, because we know that game does not work no. in turn based at mm. all. <laughs> no, having to wait for someone to click the scent. Yeah. Would just drive you insane. Uh, now what I do want to do next is um, maybe not the next game, but soon is I need to mash 
Exotica with Escalation to see how the two work. Now, we did the recommendation in the box that don't do it, play a bunch of games before you match them. Well, now we've played some, so I, I am looking forward to, to mashing that in and then probably having some final thoughts on that because I, I do plan on doing a full review of Exotica. But so far, it's looking positive. Maybe it won't mash at all with the other one. I'm just not looking forward to the massive amount of technologies that are going to be in play once I put both of those together. Like we've said before, eminent domain is all about system mastery, and I'm going to lose it all once all that's in there. So that'll be interesting. Now, the other game I got played this week was Kane Me with my oldest daughter. Uh, we already talked about Kane Me enough today, but I will say that, like I said, she's becoming quite the shark. Uh, she's really taken to it and is getting really good at the long-term planning, the the planning ahead, the seeing, oh, I want to make sure I'm in here. And she's starting to remember things. Like if I can get one of my kings into your territory, eventually that 20 scoring card is going to come up and she remembers that happened for previous games. Right. Uh, so that's been pretty cool. It, it's good to see her, like I said, learning the, the more advanced strategies of it, or I guess they're pretty obvious, but still, it's not just moving pieces on a board that she's actually getting the, the actual concepts of the game as well as the mechanics. Right. Well, now thanks to the Humble Bundle, I actually got some new to me digital gaming in with some mixed success. Uh, I haven't gone through all the different uh, games in the bundle yet, but there was an Asmodee bundle that was uh, available. And uh, we'll, I'm sure that if it's still live, there'll be a link in uh, the show notes. Uh, now, first up, I tried Potion Explosion, where I learned pretty dramatically that I'm just not good at matching games. Um, and after a few rounds of that, uh, after of that, I went through the tutorial and I played a, a few games uh, beyond that. Uh, I just kind of lost interest. Uh, yeah. They also tend to really push you towards the DLC expansion. Uh, oh, the fifth, ouch. fifth ingredient expansion, I think it's called. Uh, and it's sort of like, look at all this extra wonderful stuff you get if you buy that. And you know what? I just wasn't interested enough to invest further. That's sad to hear. Yeah. I got to admit, I tried Potion Explosion again, and I both tried it, did a demo, not a full game, a demo, at Origins, I don't know, so the, the little while <laughs> back. <laughs> not 2019, so a previous Origins, and we were not overly wowed by it. And I know people love it. I don't know, it just didn't do it for me. But I don't remember much more than that. That's how I was, it was, I, it, we didn't find, feel any need to take that one home. Yeah. It's an interesting concept. Again, it's just, I think more than anything for me, it was the style of game that just doesn't really work for me. Um, it, it felt a lot like a um, Candy Crush sort of Well, that's what it is. Right? Game. It's, a, it's a board game Candy uh, Crush. And, you know what? I'd rather, you know, let people play that on Facebook. More power to you. <laughs> I don't want that in my board game. Um, so next up was Patchwork. Uh, which was definitely my yeah. more my sort of game. And I have to say the interface on the digital version was great. Easy to play, smooth. The tutorial took me through it very nicely. You know, I, I knew what I was doing right off the bat, no questions, and jumped in and played and and you know, had some fun with it. Yeah, that one I have the I have the Android app, and I don't know how that compares to the Steam version and the Android app's fantastic. Uh, they're uh, usually pretty similar. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. It's it's a perfect implementation of patchwork it feels like playing patchwork right. i'm just not touching the pieces strategy wise everything else it, it, it's actually nice of it to sort all the stuff and do all the math for you yeah i am definitely a fan of the app version of patchwork yeah i i'm i i have no idea how horrible i would be at scoring the game patchwork yeah. after only playing digitally um but uh so next finally the, la the last one i got to and the reason why i kind of stopped doing it was the lord of the rings adventure card game and i think they call it the you know official version or something it's it's this is the the game the lord of the rings adventure card game living card game in a digital version i had really high hopes as something i could really dive into but i ended up being disappointed by the experience oh. Uh, the tutorial is really complete and very detailed about all aspects of playing the game. Like it takes you through, I think it's five or six um, scenarios and each one they add more aspects of the game in. So it's not like the first round you play isn't a complete game. There's only a few, uh, a few aspects of it you're playing and it takes you mm -hmm. through those and it makes you finish around with those few aspects so that you understand them. And then the next round it adds more. The problem is it's just not coded well. Um, it was locking up on me and it took me nine tries 
to get all the way through all the rounds of tutorial. Um, Yuck. And <laughs> you add on to that the fact that it was filled with some very, you know, thick, uh, very well, high quality voice acting, uh, mm. much of which was unskippable. And a story that, while detailed and and lively, I don't care about. I, I just want to learn how to play the game and then get into the real story. Hmm. I wasted, oh, it was probably, you know, four or five hours. Now, I was doing other things, wow. which turned out to be part of the problem. The game does not like you switching away to and from their window. And that turns out to be part of the problem. But I wasted a lot of time learning how to play the game. Now, I feel like I know I'm competent at the game, but do I want to play it again knowing that that could happen? Mm. I don't know. Yeah, that's rough. I personally, I don't own this one. I have no idea if it has anything to do with like the Pathfinder adventure card game or if that like adventure card game has this been is mo- this copyrighted. This is a living, like they, I, they describe it the somewhere as a living, living card, card game. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, again, it was, it was interesting. Uh, deck building is an asset. Luckily there's a lot of pre-built decks in there because mm. I don't feel competent enough to, to, well, to yeah. build a deck yet. Uh, even though I feel like I understand the mechanics of the game well enough, uh, the different factions and things involved in, in your deck are, are still, uh, a bit of a stretch for me to, uh, to feel like yeah. I, I knew what I was doing, building a deck, but there are again, a number of pre-built decks. So I'd like to think I'll get it back, uh, uh there again but it was quite a sour experience going through it. So anyone who does get it and wants to play it, just play it. Don't switch back and forth and, yeah. and be patient. Uh, don't try and rush ahead. Cause I found if I, if I thought I knew what I was doing and I would just click somewhere, it would get confused and, and freeze up on me wow. and I'd have to start again because there is no saving in the tutorial. Tutorial. That's rough. That yeah. is really rough. Yeah. Now, for people who are interested, I did drop a link in the chat, and we will throw this in the show notes. Uh, there are seven days left in this bundle, and this thing is fantastic. I, I got to say, this is an Asmodee Digital Play With Friends bundle through Humble Bundle. For a dollar US or a dollar fifty Canadian, you get Small World, Carcassonne, Patchwork, King and Assassins, Love Letter, and Potion Explosion. Like, that's just nuts right there. Like, a buck to a buck fifty. Now, they have a thing there where if you pay more than the average that people pay, whatever, you can pay more, you get Splendor, Mysterium, and Twilight Struggle. In addition, a bunch of expansions for Splendor, Carcassonne, and Small World. Now, if you pay $15 US or $16.50 Canadian, you get all that, so everything we already mentioned. In addition, you get Scythe, Lord of the Rings, the adventure card game, and Mysterium, and even more expansions for Carcassonne and Small World and Splendor. And then you also get 10% off if you sign up for Humble Choice, whatever. And this does support charity. This supports partners in health. So uh, this is one of the best bundles I have ever seen on digital board games. Like this is, it's crazy. Like for a buck or a buck 50, you're getting six. Well, at least like, like that's, I, I'd pay that much for Carc or patchwork and i actually love the small world app and technically it's called small world too but i would rather play that app than i would play the physical board game because there's so many little bits and chits to keep track yeah, of i, I definitely the math for you i definitely need to learn small world i haven't really i tried it once uh I've, that one i'd had before i was getting it more for yeah. all the expansions and everything uh and i i I don't really feel like I grasped that one. What I'm interested in seeing is I'm looking to get Scythe played to see, because yeah. I, again, it's it's not one of your favorite games. We've talked about it before. It never clicked with you. I'm interested in trying it out and seeing whether or not I see anything in that game or if, if yep. I'm leaning more towards you uh, with uh, the dislike. Not if other people love it, so. Yep. So how about like a look it, ahead? Yep. Fantastic bundle. Like strongly recommend Absolutely. it. Absolutely. So how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? All right, so I did get some unboxings done. So that's something knocked off the list from last week. I said it was going to get done. Um, you can expect to see those coming out on Mondays, as usual, 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern on YouTube. You'll see them. I do have some more to do, but there's no real rush on those. I don't know when I'll get some more, but I did get them done. Uh, we've got Eclipse, Second Dawn of the Galaxy, which has an interesting surprise partway through, which I wasn't very happy about. And then two games from Bicycle Cards. So those will be coming out. I don't know what we should release first. I'm thinking Eclipse probably just because that's not in retail yet. So I think as far as SEO and getting hits and so far, Bicycle hasn't pushed to get the other ones out. So 
I think we'll probably do a clip. So this coming Monday, or actually, uh, if you're listening to this live, it should be yesterday. Are, are we going to, or can we get that one last game off the pile? What uh, game is there? You do still the have pile? one last thing that was that was left yeah, over uh, from. I don't. Know. Know. I just want to get a clip out before the retail version hits. Okay, shelves. we can we can we can throw a clip so, in there. That's fine. Except, um, like I said, my my copy is not perfect. So no, no, it, there is a there is a problem there. A definite problem in it. But I lose a lot of my energy about part way through that that unboxing because I get a little frustrated. Uh, we um, still have uh, Lord of the Ring Journeys. Oh yeah, I don't know. I think everyone that wants to know what's in that probably has seen it already. <laughs> All right. Well, we can hold off on that one then. We'll yeah, we can clips. hold off on that one. Okay. Uh, the other thing I planned to do was uh, read the Shadowrun 6th edition box set. I did not get to that. Um, just didn't fit in with all the other stuff that's going on. So I think that's still on the w list for the coming week. Um, I do want to do a read review of that, so I do want to get through that box set. I just need to find the time to go. So what I would do normally is I would go to a coffee shop and get away from my kids and my mom and sit and read a role-playing book. That's one of my favorite things to do in the entire world is to sit at a coffee shop and read role-playing books. And just going down to my basement to sit and read Shadowrun, just like I, I want to do it, I kind of, but I, I'm just missing the coffee shops right now. So that one might be a bit. Um, Eminent Domain, I'm looking forward to some more Exotica. Um, cause well, know what I like about that is eminent domain is a game that rewards system mastery and playing it a bunch of times in a row, every play just feels better than the last. Cause you just feel like, you know, more of the game. It's a, it's a more engaging game. It's a closer battle. And I I've been loving the whole play it multiple times in a row. So I am looking forward to more of that and doing the whole mashup, mashing up exotica with escalation and seeing where that goes. It's going to be interesting. I had so many texts to pick from and using the scenario rules from both. Uh, Fox in the Forest test is asking, no, because I don't own Fox in the Forest, so I can't play it anymore. I returned the copy that I had on loan, so I no longer have it. Um, my wife, my awesome wife, tried to get us a copy for our anniversary, but the local game store is sold out, despite getting in, I think, six copies of each. Uh, Fox in the Forest and Duet. So we were not able to get it in time for our anniversary. So, so no more Fox in the Forest for us until we get back out to public play events and I can play with you, Tech, and show you how to play because I know you have a copy. <laughs> but yeah, I don't I don't actually own a copy of the game. We tried. All right. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Evil John, we got a chair set aside for you. It's about time we sit down for another game, maybe this Sunday. Wayne Humphrey. Thanks, Wayne. Roger Malosh. Hey, Roger, we still have to work out that Cthulhu Death May Die trade. I am trading my copy for, uh, speaking of anniversaries, an anniversary gift from my wife, a new lens for a camera. So we got to work that out somehow with this whole social distancing, a porch drop or something. Zopi, thank you. David Miller Jr. Thanks, Dave. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Uh, if you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop through our Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you. And be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on. <laughs>